I am so excited to be here. I just need to give a huge thanks to everybody at the Slow Factory, Celine, Yasmin, everyone who has helped me out. Um, and I'm really yeah, excited to be talking uh, from occupied uh, Lenape Hoking, so-called Brooklyn today. So, oh, this just, of course, this happens. It always happens. Okay, <laughs> so today's class, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, there is certainly a lot to talk about. Um, you know, each individual, uh, you know, area that I cover could be its own class. So, um, you know, if, if we want to continue the conversation outside or if you have questions, as Yasmin said, please feel free to reach out um, to Slow Factory or myself. Um, so we're going to talk about microplastics. We are going to talk about the invisible, almost, yet utterly omnipresent manifestation of petrocolonialism in the 21st century. So we're going to talk about really what happens when these human-made linear take uh, you know, make waste uh, models are going to collide with Earth's natural cycles. We're taking a linear process and it's colliding with a cyclical process and that is terrible. <laughs> so we're gonna unpack the science. As I said, there's a lot of jargon. We're gonna not cover that. I'm gonna make it as widely understandable as possible um, so that each of you can become an expert uh, and essentially have these conversations in your own communities with the people that you wanna have these conversations with. So we're gonna talk about the implications on public health, um, how microplastics disproportionately harm BIPOC, just like fossil fuels, it's a huge environmental uh, racism, environmental justice issue. Um, and then we're gonna talk about solutions because it can't be all bad, right? <laughs> so really quickly, I wanted to talk about myself just a little bit so that you understand where I'm coming from. So as Yasmeen mentioned, I am the very proud uh, uh, policy and science climate fellow at Seeding Sovereignty, which is a fantastic organization that I do encourage all of you to check out. Um, I am a lifelong climate activist. I started my first nonprofit when I was nine. <laughs> and so I, I call myself sort of a climate advocate because that covers so much ground. But um, I really work in sustainable fashion, slow fashion, and microplastics science. Um, I am so privileged to have been able to study these concepts in higher education um, to go to crazy places like the Arctic and, and Indonesia um, and the Galapagos and like the middle of the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> uh, to study uh, microplastics. So my job here, as I mentioned, is to open the gates of higher ed virtually, of course, and so that all of you guys can become experts and we can really redefine what it means to be an expert. So overview of the course, we're gonna talk about really the science, just the basic definition of microplastics, a little bit of the categories. Gonna talk about the life cycle, which as I mentioned is kind of an oxymoron because it's not a cycle, it's linear. Uh, we're gonna cover the human harm implications. We're gonna cover uh, environmental justice, social justice, and then we're gonna talk about solutions. So very basic level definition of a microplastic. Any plastic particle measuring five millimeters or under in diameter is a microplastic. This is a picture that I actually took uh, off of a boat off of the Galapagos, I believe. Might have been Indonesia, actually. Yes, I wrote it, Indonesia. <laughs> and this is what we use to count and sort microplastics after we've collected a sample because this grid represents five millimeters. So this is a photo that I took. Um, so basic definition. Now, there are two categories. There are primary microplastics and there are secondary microplastics. So the image with my hand that I also took um, is basically showing the pre-production plastic pellets, which essentially a primary microplastic is any type of microplastic that is produced as a microplastic. It is produced as a tiny piece of plastic measuring five millimeters or less in diameter. So as I mentioned, there are these things called pre-production pellets. Sometimes we call them nurdles, uh, which essentially are the components that get melted and molded into the macro plastics, like they're, you know, plastic bottles and all that, the, the laundry detergent. Um, 
and there are micro bees, which are not pictured, but they're so, so, so tiny. Luckily, Obama passed the Micro Bee Free Waters Act of 2017, I believe. Um, and some other countries have passed bans, but uh, still, these are basically a cosmetic grade um, exfoliant. They, <laughs> I can get into it, but essentially the um, cosmetics industry was like, let's figure out something that sounds cool that people will want to buy. It's a marketing ploy. People have been using organic exfoliants for literally millennia. Um, and so this is an unnecessary, perfect example of poor design that we will get into later. So these are, and of course, actually microbeads are also used in, um, you know, um, blasting of like ex basically uh, blasting ships. So of course that goes directly into the waterways. So those are the primary micro microplastics. Basically they're produced as microplastics, but then the category that probably a lot of you are familiar with, if you are familiar with microplastics, is these secondary microplastics. So those are what we're going to mainly talk about today, um, although all of them are valid. Um, included in these are microfibers. So it is anything that comes from a larger piece of plastic that has broken down and is infiltrated into ecosystems. And I want to basically get into now um, the life cycle. So big key takeaway is over 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels. This is one of the takeaways that we're gonna focus on today uh, because I think shifting the understanding from a consumer perspective, although that is totally valid and really important, and talking about plastics and microplastics in particular, really as a fossil fuels issue. Like this is a climate crisis issue. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about the whole down the line um, beginning to end, because of course there is an end. And at the very beginning, we have fossil fuels. So really what happens is petroleum or natural gas um, is mined. It is then shipped to a refining facility. And it is then uh, basically through various chemical processes um, extruded into these pre-production pellets that then get melted down into the macroplastics. So we have oil well, oil tanker, goes to the refinery, plastics plant, pellets, and then the factory. And then, you know, I'm, we need to talk about the types of plastic too, and I'm sure actually Dr. Shiros in her conversation last week um, covered this as well, that it's important to talk about the types of plastic that gets extruded um, because it's really difficult to sort and it is essentially this complication leads to um, the lack of infrastructure that's available to take care of these plastics, hence why a lot of them make that make it into the environment. So these classifications of which there are seven, one through seven, basically delineate the chemical makeup of different types of plastic based on density um, and other factors as well. So I wanna talk for a second about debunking the Chasing Arrows logo. <laughs> I think probably a lot of us understand by now that um, it is, was really a marketing ploy kind of co-opted by plastics producers uh, to confuse people into thinking that it equals the, the, the recyclability of the plastic. Unfortunately, the Chasing Arrows symbol does not um, have much correlation to whether or not that product is recyclable. It's literally a symbol that just looks like recycling and people in their heads associate it. So only 9% of plastic gets recycled, unfortunately. Um, and it's also tricky to uh, figure out, you know, by color. I mean, literally, it's so easy to contaminate the stream of waste that recyclers have a very difficult time um, sorting. And there's just not enough sort of, um, uh, you know, overall unanimous understanding and, you know, classifications um, and policy really um, that informs the production of plastics. And I would like to shed light really quickly on the other, which is number seven, because we've kind of heard of like PET, high density polyethylene, which is HDPE, you know, PVC, right, vinyl. Um, but the other is just like a free, free range. I mean, so we really need um, more understanding, legislation, um, 
and regulation of this issue. So again, as I mentioned, also all municipalities have different recycling capacity. So all of these factors, right, the, the lack of clarity and the lack of regulation um, and the lack of uh, infrastructure make it so that plastics just there's no closed loop recycling system. So this is a photo that I love because I actually took it as part of the Slow Factory um, uh, Landfills as Museums program, which I had the most amazing time at. I think visiting a landfill is just shocking um, and a really important uh, experience to have. So there are so many ways, right? We're thinking like, okay, now I know what a plastic, a microplastic is. Now I know that it comes from fossil fuels. Um, but like, how does it actually get into the environment? I mean, like, okay, you know, they just like, what, they just leak or what? So these are the ways. Um, pellets and beads, oftentimes they're transported through these huge tankers across the world. And if you have like one crack in this tanker, um, you'll see, you know, there will be reports of beaches that are just covered in trillions of these things because they just leak. Um, so that's one way that's terrifying. Um, as I mentioned, poor product design, like, Literally, manufacturers are just not thinking about the end of life, right? Um, so there's poor waste recovery. Um, and this includes textiles, bi these big macroplastics, that, you know, not, they can be huge, right? We could talk about ghost nets, fishing nets. We could also talk about your plastic bottle and the straw that is the most common uh, examples of these single use disposables. Um, and then the primary microplastics, as I mentioned, pellets, beads, um, you know, micro beads are a rinse off product. So talk about design. They're literally designed to be rinsed into the water, which is just shocks me every time I think about that. Um, it's also important to understand that, um, you know, microplastics can be, as I mentioned with micro beads, they just go into the wastewater there. They are released with storm water. Um, and I think a huge topic that is deserves its whole own entire talk is microfibers because we, we wear polyfibers. I mean, we wear man-made fibers um, in our clothing. And every time you buy something, you wash it with your um, regular washing machine and dryer. Although some washing machines now are being manufactured to have um, added filters built in. But if you're a conscious citizen, you've got to buy your own filter. It's external. There's actually something fantastic called the Filtrol, F-I-L-T-R-O-L, um, that works. You could get a guppy bag, but all these things, there is a margin of error here. So washing our clothes releases these fibers into the waste stream directly. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about the, where these microplastics go, because in the ocean and in bodies of water, um, this is the perfect example of man-made, uh, uh, you know, um, basically man-made processes, a man-made, you know, uh, thing, <laughs> microplastics, <laughs> just with a totally linear uh, life cycle, right? Just colliding into Earth's natural cycles. So when we talk about how a plastic bottle becomes a microplastic, this is how. The recycling system is not great. Uh, a plastic bottle, finds its way into a body of water. Now what it does is there are a couple factors that essentially break this product down into trillions of pieces of microplastics. So it photo oxidizes, meaning the sun's rays make it brittle and then it becomes very easy to be uh, thrashed amongst you know, the currents and the waves. Also, um, there has been research released uh, this fantastic paper by Dr. Marcus Erickson of the Five Gyres Institute um, about actually critters like eating these things. They're taking bites. There's so many pieces of plastic that has been found with like turtle bites, trigger fish bites. So there's actually animals that are continuing to break these pieces apart, especially as they become more brittle. Um, and so what happens is this is a map, as I should have mentioned at the beginning, of all of the oceanic gyres that exist uh, in the world. There is the highest concentration of microplastics and microparticles in the North Pacific gyre um, because of, you know, geographic location of, um, you know, strength of current and a couple other factors that basically 
this is like the map of where your, your plastics are going. So I think that as a general concept, um, understanding that microplastics are in the global ocean and they are cycling with the ocean's currents. So this is why we talk about, you might've heard of like the trash island or, you know, basically it's not, it's not an island the size of Texas that has pieces of large plastic sitting there. It's actually like a sludge, like a soup of trillions and trillions of pieces of mobile, not static, microplastics. Okay, so you, next thought you must be thinking, of course, there's infiltration in the food chain. So it's a no brainer, right? We put microplastics into the environment and critters like fish, they think that it's food or they want to build a house with it and they eat it or they want to feed it to their young because they think it's a piece of phytoplankton or what have you. Um, so unfortunately, from phytoplankton, I, I was lucky enough to um, work with a researcher um, named Joachim Goes uh, of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia, who studied phytoplankton absorption of, um, of microplastics. So from phytoplankton to whales, this is the food chain. Microplastics have completely infiltrated. Okay. I mentioned that the life cycle of microplastics is linear and we just talked about kind of where it starts and where we're at now. Um, so just to give an overview, it starts at the oil well or the natural gas well. It gets um, you know, refined into pre-production pellets and there's leakage into the environment through that process, right? Because the pellets get transported um, and there are tears in the either the tankers or the cartons that are carrying them, or they're literally just small enough to be blown away by the air. And then the pellets get molded down into macroplastics, which as I mentioned, because of our terribly under-designed and poorly designed um, recycling system in this country and some other countries, although of course some other countries are way better at this than we are, um, there's leakage there, right? Because recycling is only 9%. And then they get molded into microplastics, or sorry, they don't get molded. They break down, right, into microplastics. Um, and those microplastics have infiltrated the food chain, which of course, of course, there's someone cleaning my street. Uh, of course, there is leakage through the food chain, right? They, they come into the environment through the uh, just being in the ocean. And then they also are in our air, water, and soil. So now you're thinking, okay, they're everywhere, right? They must be coming to us as human beings and then reintroduced into water systems like cycling the globe as we cover in the gyres uh, graphic. So petroleum to plastic, to phytoplankton, to our plates, to plasma proteins. What does this mean, Madeline? I'm going to tell you. We are going to talk about human harm. And this, this is where it gets like, this is where it gets crazy. <laughs> so I want to reiterate the point, which is I think a key point, is from the tops of the Himalayas to the deepest points of the Mariana Trench, plastic pollution and microplastics are everywhere and they are a planetary boundary threat. So I'm gonna talk about what that means, but I think if you take away like one to three things from this talk, one of them should be the fact that plastic, this is not hyperbole, like I'm not exaggerating. Um, it is simply everywhere. You know, there are fibers on our surfaces of our home. Um, actually a bunch of French researchers found that there's just tons of microfibers on the surfaces of tree leaves just in France. Um, there are really have been found in kind of every point of earth. Um, and I think that is very important to, to think about. So as I mentioned, they are simply everywhere. These are fantastic images, sad but beautiful, um, collected by Sherry Mason in 2019 in the Great Lakes. And I think the Great Lakes was one of the first locations where researchers found tons of microbeads um, and it became apparent that microplastics are simply everywhere. Um, 
I'll talk briefly about the concept of microplastics being airborne, because really what I'm talking about is microfibers. Uh, they're light enough to just go along with the breeze and you know, really be integrated into the water systems of this planet. I mean, they get picked up um, in the smog, they, they are in clouds, they get rained down, they're just they're just everywhere. Um, and in soils, it's particularly sad because um, there is a paper that I'd also would be happy to link, which re referenced um, essentially when microfibers and plastics in general are in the soil system, they uh, lower the growth rate of crops and they lower the um, size and lifespan of worms in the soil. Um, so when I mentioned on this slide that micro, that plastics and microplastics are a planetary boundary threat, what I'm talking about, if you're not familiar with planetary boundaries, is if you think about it more like planetary, not physical boundaries, but like capacity, um, there are several planetary boundaries that have been researched by this fantastic colleague and friend of mine, Patricia Villarubia Gomez, um, who is in Sweden, um, in Stockholm, and she's researching planetary boundaries. It's essentially um, this concept that Earth can only take so much, right? So in terms of plastics, Earth processes can only take a certain volume and that is the boundary. So microplastics might be threatening Earth's system processes, which is a planetary boundary threat. So we've covered a lot already in 22 minutes only. <laughs> we've talked about what microplastics are. We've talked about petroleum. We've talked about their life cycle. We've talked about how they are in the air the water systems, the tops of mountains, the bottom of the sea, they're in soil and they're in the marine food chain. Okay, the next logical point is that they're in us. So this is a fantastic graphic <laughs> that I took from an article um, in The Independent. Um, and, you know, I think that if you're aware of this issue to a certain degree, you might be aware of this concept that this paper came out like a couple of months ago or maybe last year that was talking about the credit card, right? Like the average American adult ingests enough plastic that is basically the size of a credit card every week. Um, and I think that when oftentimes when we hear things like that, it's very difficult to understand because we're like, well, we're, I'm alive and kicking. Like if I have a microplastics, you know, the size of a credit card cumulatively in my body every week on average, um, and I'm still alive and breathing and I don't seem to have many health issues related to that, then why exactly does that matter? Um, and I'm gonna get into that, but first I'll, I'll sort of specify how they enter, like what are the pathways that they enter our bodies? And really this is a huge statement about um, environmental justice because we get them from mainly eating seafood, drinking bottled water, which again, another paper found that bottled water contains two times more microplastics than tap, um, and simply breathing air and wearing synthetic fibers. So if you're someone who relies on seafood for your livelihood, for your diet, um, and if you're someone who needs to drink bottled water because, oh, you're a person of color and you are, um, you know, all of a sudden this plant, uh, this fossil fuel plant, this oil refinery, what have you, comes and decides to station itself, you know, a mile from your house and now your water's contaminated. Well, you have to drink bottled water, um, but unfortunately now you're going to be ingesting more toxins and microplastics through bottled water. So it is a huge problem, totally environmental justice issue. Um, and as I mentioned, wearing synthetic fibers is also extremely um, uh, important to understand. Um, what am I gonna do? I have a fabulous like glitter disco dress. Like, are you telling me not to wear that? <laughs> no, it's all about moderation and kind of understanding so that you know um, what's happening. And in terms of action, it's difficult to minimize our exposure. I think that's just a simple, simply put, if microplastics are everywhere, it is absolutely impossible to eliminate our exposure. So it's about understanding how you're getting microplastics into your body. And now we're gonna talk about um, health. So I think it's important to clarify that there's two concepts um, in terms of plastics and our health. 
right? So there's plastic itself, which is, um, here, wait, let me see. Okay, you know what, I'm, okay. So let me talk about this. There's plastic itself, which is um, considered safe, right? And I put that in quotations. For example, if you're like so tired and you're like, I have been cooking all week, I'm gonna order some, whatever you wanna order, take out. And it's a, some soup and it's in a plastic container. We, I hope we all are kind of conscious of like, is that safe? You know, like, I feel like there's something happening. Maybe it's leaching. Like, why is there a, um, like a sheen, like a rainbow sheen on the top of my soup, which I have witnessed and got kind of terrified. <laughs> uh, so there's plastic itself, like the chemicals inside of plastic that we are going to talk about. Um, and then there's the toxins that are in the environment, okay, that attach themselves to microplastics. So this is another key takeaway. Microplastics in water act like magnets for hydrophobic toxins. What does that mean? So this is a fantastic graphic, albeit a little bit scary, about biomagnification and bioaccumulation of toxins. So it is kind of a, uh, the, the principle of biomagnification is that um, a toxin that starts off inside of the digestive tract or the body or the tissues of a smaller organism. Um, as the organism, uh, the, the toxins move up the food chain because fatty tissues are the perfect resting place for toxins, the larger animals have a higher density, a higher concentration of toxins, which is why if we're talking about fish, we talk about mercury, you know, limiting your consumption of salmon because you don't, because, you know, if you eat a piece of shrimp, it's going to have less mercury because it has less fatty tissues. So that's biomagnification, bioaccumulation, and we can apply that principle to microplastics. So as I mentioned, microplastics are magnets for hydrophobic, which basically toxins that are um, not afraid because um, they, they, they avoid their repellent to water. And these are the endocrine disrupting POPs. And I think it's important to know what that stands for because they're pretty much everywhere. Persistent organic pollutant, POP. Um, and they're persistent because they have been manufactured for various reasons. DDT is a great example, right? Um, PCBs, a lot of flame retardants, um, PLA, like all of these kind of um, toxins that are man-made that are created in order to specifically never break down. So they're created to continue and they're created to, for example, um, if you're thinking about like a raincoat or something that may, it might be covered in uh, PFAS, um, or it might be covered in a toxin that repels water, you know, like a nonstick pan that you don't exactly know what the, the coating is, might be something like this. And unfortunately, these toxins are very serious. We've heard of DDT um, as a pesticide, and it's still absolutely around today. So moving on. Um, when these persistent organic pollutants bind to microplastics, the fish that eat them, as I mentioned, because they're fully in infiltrated into the food chain, biomagnify up the food chain. So when we eat a larger piece of fish, I think that it's, it's important to understand that um, we are not just eating a piece of fish that contains pieces of plastic, right? We're not just eating something that has physical plastic particles and like, oh, those plastic particles won't hurt me. We're actually eating like a very high concentration of biomagnified persistent organic pollutants that have attached themselves to the plastics within the fish. So that's an important uh, clarification. As I mentioned, virgin plastic is considered safe, um, which is why a lot of it is like food grade or you can heat up your food in it. Um, I, would, I would question that, I would look more into that um, as a consumer, as an individual. So as I mentioned, um, there's the plastic itself, right? Like when you're heating up your takeout, but then there's the persistent organic pollutants that are magnified inside of the microplastics. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about what that means because you're like, okay, well, that's terrifying. Um, and what exactly does that mean? So there are additives and plasticizers um, that are added into various plastics in the process of manufacturing. Um, a lot of these are endocrine disruptors. So as I mentioned, the plastics themselves can be endocrine disruptors. Um, the leakage of these things in the environment is something to definitely look into. As I mentioned, PFOAs and levels of plastic additives in the bloodstream um, tests were, were found to be 85 to 90% in individuals in the United States that were tested. Um, there's a fantastic book um, called Our Stolen Future, um, which is essentially about how the additives and the chemistry in the industry are um, have implications for our fertility and for you know hormonal function and um, fetal development um, and potentially change the way that we behave. So I, I encourage you to look into that book as well. So getting a little bit more specific into the fertility concerns of plastic um, inside our bodies, there's a fantastic paper that I'm, I'm going to link as well from Gazomp, which is um, a part of the UN, which is looking into this. Um, this diagram is by Dr. Shauna Swan, who has been doing this work up at the um, Columbia Hospital, I think it's Mount Sinai or Econ, um, Icon, um, which is, she's been doing this for basically the bulk of her career, studying um, plastics and, and fertility. She's a fertility expert. And so this graph shows a sperm decline in Western countries over the last several decades and what it's projected to look like. And so there are two papers that were published, I think pretty recently, and some of you might be aware of them because I think that the placenta paper, the graphic from which I actually took earlier in this presentation um, was, uh, was pretty scary and was widely shared. So talking about fertility in terms of microplastics, when they get small enough, then they can be considered to be nanoplastics. And those are the ones that we need to think about in terms of they're crossing the, um, the blood barrier into the placenta. There, um, there was another paper that I referenced in a, a, um, my most widely watched reel on Instagram about uh, fertility in terms of micro plastics coagulating and accumulating in scrota, men's scrota, um, and, and um, inhibiting uh, sperm count. So there's a lot to, to look into here. So as I mentioned, nanoplastics are the where we should be looking, I would say, um, as if we shouldn't be looking everywhere else. So this fantastic um, and scary uh, graphic was from a paper um, by Gopinath et al. Um, in 2019, which essentially found that nanoplastics like to bind to blood plasma proteins. And when they bind to blood plasma proteins, they denature certain chemical uh, makeup of the plasma and some of, some, some of the time render it non-functioning. So this is a really serious um, thing to think about. I encourage you to read the paper. Um, and as I mentioned, nanoplastics, in addition to um, actually like chemically interacting with blood plasma, they found that they were physically like coagulating in bloodstreams. Um, and as I mentioned, we, they cross the placenta. And what would be very scary is really looking into the implications on from a public health perspective of how they infiltrate the cell wall. Uh, because microplastics obviously can't do that, five millimeters or less, but nanoplastics are on a micrometer scale and they're small enough to enter the cell wall. So, okay. Madeline, <laughs> you just laid out a bunch of research and a, you just made a bunch of claims about health and I'm terrified. How bad really is this? So I think we have to be careful here because as a scientist and as someone who works with scientists, it's really important that we don't make overarching claims that aren't backed up. So there's a lot of like, this could have serious implications, this has the potential to be serious. Um, so I think that, you know, this is sort of a looking into the scientific method of scientists, we, we don't make overarching claims that are um, clickbait or what have you. So it's important to take what I'm saying through a lens of curiosity, um, reading the papers themselves um, and understanding that my sort of philosophy is that 
we can say we don't know exactly how the microplastics or nanoplastics harm our health or our bodily functions in general, but we can use our understanding of maybe past things that people used to think were healthy, like smoking or, you know, what have you. So even if we don't have all the research now, you as a consumer, you as an individual um, can be making actions um, that lessen your either exposure, but also really, um, and we'll get into later in terms of actionable items, um, looking towards legislation that stops the production of plastic. So there's a lot we don't know. That's kind of the takeaway here. There's a lot we know, but there's really a lot that we don't know. Um, so, okay, <laughs> now you're like, Madeline, you just talked all about how microplastics are in my body. They could be really harming my health. How do I minimize my exposure? Like, how the heck can I try to avoid these things? Um, and the truth of this fantastic graphic by Orb Media, which showed the um, statistic that I cited earlier about how bottled water contains two times more um, higher levels of microplastic than does tap. Um, we can minimize our, you know, drinking of tap water. If you can't, you know, that's, that's a problem, right? That's why there's, it's a social justice problem. Um, you know, as I mentioned, limiting our consumption of seafood. Some people really can't do that. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be talking about, we shouldn't be telling anybody, right, what to do and what not to do, but it's important that they know. Um, and then, as I mentioned, limiting our um, wearing of polyfiber clothing. If you're interested in buying a water filter or figuring out like the best way to uh, consume water, 0.2 microns is su sufficient for filtration. So there has been research and you can also just Google this that like, you know, the um, Brita filter or what have you, like even a charcoal filter does something. So um, that's good news, obviously. And I wanna talk about the people that I learned from because I need to give these people credit. I mean you know, this amazing research that I did with Five Gyres Institute, this adorable family, Dr. Marcus Erickson, his wife um, and co-director Anna Cummins and their beautiful girl, Bonnie. Um, and as I mentioned, Patty, my colleague and friend, her research is very, um, I mean, terrifying, but cutting edge. Um, Rich Thompson is considered the father of microplastics who really put this concept on the map a couple, um, I wanna say a couple decades ago. Um, and then another colleague and friend, Carolyn Box, who's based out of the Bay Area, who's doing a fantastic um, microfibers uh, project in the SFA. Um, so I just had to give a shout out to all these fantastic researchers and people who I absolutely cannot um, ignore. Okay. So we've talked about what a microplastic is, we've talked about the life cycle, we've talked about human harm. Now I'm gonna talk about environmental justice because I've referenced it a couple of times and it, it's kind of like, doesn't really deserve its own, it's kind of the overarching concept, but it's important to talk about the specifics. So as I mentioned, microplastics are a byproduct of environmental racism. What does that mean? So what you're seeing on the right is what the kind of generally uh, referred to as trash pickers, which is absolutely does not give these individuals um, the justice that they deserve because so many people in the world, their livelihood is to actually deal with waste, recycling waste. And I think it's so important to highlight these people because we would, our problem would be like totally magnified without these individuals. Um, and oftentimes these people are low income. Um, they're in countries that have basically been, uh, Western countries have dumped their waste on them and now they're having to deal with it. Um, so, you know, I think talking about like microplastics colonizing our bodies is one thing. And really in general, they're just, just colonizing everywhere on earth. And I do find, I really think that they are kind of just the, the, as I mentioned, the invisible example that is omnipresent of petrocolonialism in the 21st century. So a lot of people of the global South really bear the burden, as I mentioned also the trash pickers, quote unquote, and island nations, poorer countries just taking our waste. Um, so this is a really important thing to talk about. This, if you're interested in like the front lines work, um, this is a photo of protesters, people in St. James Parish in Louisiana, which has also been deemed, uh, coined the um, 
a cancer alley uh, and there is a plastics plant uh, that is being built there called the Formosa plant. So talking about the front lines, the people who are absolutely bearing the brunt of this um, and there's a fantastic woman named Sharon Levine who is doing the majority of the work down there. So I highly encourage you to support um, Rise St. James and Sharon Levine's work in Louisiana. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff, <laughs> kind of sad. And I've got five minutes to go. So we're gonna talk about the good stuff. We're gonna talk about solutions. So, okay, key takeaways, right, so far have been um, microplastics are everywhere, like not hyperbole. Microplastics are an environmental justice issue. We're talking about human health. And I think that in terms of action, the key takeaway is yes, Upcycling polyfibers into a shoe is great. Upcycling um, things is wonderful, right? Um, finding uses for existing plastic is wonderful, but ultimate goal like that we're striving towards is stopping at the source, stopping production, minimizing the production, which is, as I mentioned also, very much a climate crisis issue. So we need political intervention, like simple as that. Um, Something that is a great example of a real world um, political intervention that is kind of in the works is uh, Rep, uh, Representative Lowenthal. And also there was another, um, they, he co-authored a bill called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of uh, 2020. And this bill would be pretty serious for um, the United States in general. Um, so we got to look at that. They introduced it in the house, I think last year. And then really ultimately using less. And this is a whole other topic in terms of environmental justice, especially with COVID. Mm, I think a lot of us in this time of kind of survival mode of the past year have gotten a little closer if we weren't there before to understanding priorities. Like when you're just trying to survive amidst a pandemic, take out, no, like not a priority. I'm just trying to survive. So hopefully if there's anything good to take out of that, understanding that we've gotten a little bit more empathy towards the individuals on this planet who are just trying to survive and understanding that telling someone to use less is, it, you know, sometimes you just can't, you know, that's not how the system is designed. And unfortunately it shouldn't be up to us as individuals, but we as individuals can demand of our elected officials that they change. Uh, oh, and also there's a fantastic bill that I watched a Zoom, um, Todd Kaminsky, Senator, um, I believe it's like an extended producer responsibility bill. So um, we should keep that on your radar as well for New York. And that could be pretty great. Okay, I don't have much time. So this is another example of a whole nother conversation right? Bioplastics. If you're familiar with this, it's just, it's so hard to uh, explain to people, right, who are just trying to do well. Um, I think the key takeaway here is that bioplastic, that doesn't have anything to do with end of life. The term bioplastic is actually specifically only about the feedstock that that product comes from. So like, you can extract um, compounds of corn and sugar and make plastic and make PLA. Um, so it's not that it's biodegradable, it's just that it, it's plastic, but it didn't come from oil. Okay, so that's a key takeaway as well. Um, there are many pitfalls of bioplastics, um, including the fact that basically they don't have a, they don't have an end of life plant. Like there's no infrastructure to deal with them. So if you throw them in a landfill, they aren't, they're not in the right conditions, they'll create methane. Um, but if you throw them in compost, they don't create um, enough organically available material that is like rich in the nutrients necessary for the composter to then sell it to a farmer or something. So there's just no place for them. So um, for many other reasons that I don't have time to go into, but that could again include its whole other slide, bioplastics is a no-no. Okay, where are we headed? What's going on? Like, what is the future looking like? Um, another key takeaway, <laughs> which is a little bit lower on the rung, but um, also important is that when plastic in the oceans is circulating throughout the, the gyres, 
it actually attaches to certain compounds and like slowly sinks. So if you think about our anthropogenic footprint, that very much includes like a totally like um, measurable layer of plastic on the bottom of the ocean. And we, we liken it to smog, Dr. Marcus Erickson of Five Gyres coined this term because this concept of like, it's slowly sinking and you can't just take a net, just like a smog in the ocean, you can't clean it up and just fix the problem from cleaning it up. Um, and then there's a huge push from the plastics industry. Like they're planning to just completely skyrocket their production of fossil fuels um, in order to make plastics, shifting away from energy sources, but shifting onto plastics. So we've got to be aware of that. There are some amazing circular solutions in the pipeline, um, no pun intended, um, plastic credit system, um, which could be really cool. Ultimately, we need divestment, like divesting from fossil fuels is absolutely key to tackling the plastics problem and the climate crisis um, and creating modular designs, like getting companies to actually think and be like, where is this going? We need to place the externalized cost back onto the producer so that they've got to pay for the mess that they made um, and ultimately looking into circular solutions. Um, so conclusion, I think that this is a really key thing, right? There is no away. We're talking about throwing something away, but there is no away. This is what happens when you know human beings, linear processes just full on collide into Earth's cycles. Earth is going to cycle everything we make. And so the toxins are just gonna keep on cycling if we don't fix this problem. Um, and I think that, you know, yeah, we started in 1950, we figured out how to make cellophane and like, you know, now here we are, we're in 2021 and it's everywhere. It's in our bodies, it's impacting our fertility. Um, and I think that it, you know, has a, we need to reframe this issue in terms of privilege, climate crisis um, and environmental justice. So that concludes my talk. Um, you know, I really breeze through things. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. And I think Yasmin is gonna like moderate the question situation and I'm happy to answer. There's a question from A that asks, which changes in our lifestyle should we prioritize in minimizing contact and impact with microplastics? You know, you covered a few, a few ways, but I think it would be, interesting to see maybe which ones you have prioritized in your life to yeah. minimize that, that contact. Definitely. Um, great question. I think that also, I find that just as important as minimizing like the physical ingestion of microplastics is minimizing the exposure to like hot or warm plastic containers, like containing food items. So I try to, um, like when I get takeout, because I do, obviously, like, <laughs> that would be unrealistic to say that I didn't. Um, I, like, try to not get, like, warm food, which is so unrealistic, right? So you can just call your, oh, use Deliver Zero if you're in New York, if you can. I think they're expanding. It's like a zero waste kind of food delivery takeout. Um, and I would also say, um, you know, sometimes I actually call the restaurant and just if they're close by to me, I can say, will you take my own container and I co come and give them my glass container. If that's not available to you, if you don't have the time, the energy, the capacity, um, then I would say, um, like, try, I would say clothes is a big one. Like try to use um, clothing that is not a polyfiber. Um, so that's what I prioritize. And, you know, I didn't even get into like individual behaviors because all of us understand like using reusables, um, but that is, that is a big one. So I try to, I also like use, um, you know, reusable straws and all that stuff. Like I'm doing my part too with that. Thank you. And actually, speaking of clothing, Hazley has a question about how does wearing plastic fiber clothing, so polyester, recycled polyester, or anything that, you know, viscose, all of those, um, how, do, how does wearing those types of clothing increase the microplastic concentration in our bodies? So the question really is about, is it primarily from an indirect mechanism through 
washing and our water systems? Or is there a direct way that microfibers enter our bodies through skin contact? Yeah, yeah, great question. So both basically, um, when I talk about minimizing, I'm actually talking about ingesting microfibers that are shed through friction with the garment. So through our air pathways, our mouth, our nose. Um, and, but as you mentioned, Yasmin as well, um, washing our garments and having the fibers enter the environment through that um, is also a big one. So it's actually both, but, but specifically I'm talking about, um, but about like physical ingestion. I don't know if there's research out there that is actually proving that fibers are like entering through skin contact, but we definitely breathe them in. So there are a few questions around bioplastics as an alternative, because we know those are really highly marketed as, um, you know, a more sustainable alternative. And a few people, including Jasper and Jared, are asking if you can expand a little bit on the greenwashing of bioplastics and, you know, which are the major ones to avoid? Yes, great, great questions. And I'm glad to talk more about it. So uh, I think I mentioned that the bioplastic, the term it really just comes from the feedstock. It doesn't talk about the capacity. So there's so much greenwashing out there that people think that like, oh, brands will just market their products as compostable, um, biodegradable. And we don't, that, that's like, those are claims that aren't being checked. Um, and I would suggest that you guys check out. I think I failed to um, to reference verbally the slide of bioplastics. It's from the Ban List 2.0 BAN Better Alternatives Now, uh, and please check out that paper. It's publicly available. Um, many organizations put their heads together, including Five Gyres, to put that together. They basically, um, gosh, I could talk about this forever. Basically. Uh, only like one or two out of the over 20 um, products that were marketed as biodegradable or compostable were actually marine or terrestrially compostable. Now, you know, for example, okay, in practice, right? You go to a restaurant, you get takeout. Oh, the restaurant's being eco-friendly because they have compostable packaging. Unfortunately, a lot, of, most of the time, that packaging is bound um, with, um, chemicals, water resistant chemicals like PLA, PFAS and PFAS um, that make it not healthy for us. Um, but also they make it so that it can't be composted in the composting facility that might accept your compost, but they also can't be backyard composted. So you have to throw them in the garbage. And what happens when you throw them in the garbage? They don't really, the organic compounds break down, but um, they actually, actually that's not true. The organic compounds don't break down because they don't have the right conditions. They don't have the right conditions. They produce methane, which is a way more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, and then if it's like paper plus poly plus corn starch plus, you know, then, then there's microplastics when it actually breaks down. Um, I'm really glossing over a lot. So I would say check out the BAN, Better Alternatives Now, list 2.0. Thank you. And on that note of bioplastics, Deb is asking if bioplastics are magnets of toxins in the same way that oil plastics are. That's or a good, a yeah, that's such a good question. Um, to the extent that the bioplastic, it depends on what it's made from, right? So if the bioplastic is um, like if the molecular makeup of the plastic is actual PLA, then absolutely. Um, you know, if it's a bioplastic that is um, made from some other compound that is um, not like specifically like a, a plastic molecule, then I actually don't know. But it's tricky because oftentimes those biodegradable bioplastics containers don't they don't really have a place to go so um that yeah that's a great question i would say to the extent that that it depends on what they're made of and to the extent that they are pla then yes also something that ayuva studio um, brought up in the comment section is that 
um, vegan leather is actually just plastic. That's also a major greenwashing and marketing um, fad. So make sure that you're aware. Yeah, people are upset. Yeah, that it, <laughs> vegan leather is plastic. It's made of plastic. That's what makes it vegan. So sometimes vegan does not mean um, more sustainable or better for the environment. Yes. Um, Sorry, quickly, Yasmin. I would add that I think that we're going to see hopefully a lot of um, alternatives hitting the mainstream soon that are more from, you know, whatever we've heard of like cactus leathers and pineapple leathers and stuff. It gets tricky too, right? Because those have to be treated or they have to be bound by something. And animal leathers, there's a lot of chemicals that go into that process too. So um, if you're looking to find like the best the best option. I'm always, I'm always a secondhand, secondhand proponent. Yes. The most sustainable garment is the one that already exists because Uh we don't create a new one. Yeah. Um, so Eden is asking if you can explain what an anthropogenic footprint is. You briefly mentioned that, and I think it would be nice to dive it deeper into that a little bit. Definitely. So we, the term anthropogenic just means of human beings, essentially, like um, um, if we talk about anthropogenic climate change, it means that it's human made climate change. So when I talk about the plastic smog of microplastics coating the floor of the ocean um, as an anthropogenic footprint, I mean that if somebody (laughs) were to do like, you know how, you know, geologists or or other scientists do like ice cores and they can check out the different geologic um, eras based on the uh, types of kind of molecules in the air that were caught by that particular sheet of ice, etc. When I say that I'm talking about like if someone were to do like a core of the ocean um, and a cross section, there would be a section of plastic and they'd be like, oh, that's human beings. That was when they were alive. Well, thank you both so much, Madeline and Veronica. This was such an informative class. And as you said, yes, we need to make all of this education that is typically um, gatekept in higher education. And that's what open education is here for, to bring access to everybody um, to this really, really vital education and conversation so that we are all moved Um, to act and implement um, action and push for legislation. So thank you so, so much. Thank you everyone for joining and for staying um, for this Q&A. We'll be sharing all of these resources. And as usual, please tag us in everything that you post. We love seeing all of the information and the beautiful art that you create from these classes. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much and take care. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to Slow Factory. I'll stop sharing my screen.